Welcome to the Charlotte Buzz, where we drink beer from local breweries while telling stories about the neighborhoods they're from. I'm Chrissy, and this is Drew. And today, we are drinking Swale Rider. It better be Swale. Anytime I hear Rider in like some weird context like that, I just keep thinking of like, what is it, Low Rider or whatever is the like, Nicolas Cage stealing cars. That's gone in 60 seconds. Yeah. What's this, their song that they're like? Oh, low ra -der. Yeah. That one. Yeah, that's what it makes me think of every time. Okay. Well, a swell is a wave. That it is. So, and there's a surfer on the can. Nuh-uh. So I think that's what they were going for. Nuh-uh. It's a Tangerine Session IPA. 5.1%. Well, all right. It's very, like, golden, but not like, it's like a juicy golden. But not. Yeah. Because they say, like, like the hazy IPA is the juicy one, right? Yeah. Or like a, I don't know. That's, yeah, I'm trying to find a different descriptor for this color, and I'm struggling clearly, so. I'm going to go with apple juice. I mean, you're not wrong. You get away with apple juice. Saying, just pour it in an apple juice bottle. Walk around town. I mean, twist my arm. I can smell it from here. I mean, it smells like beer. I'm just saying it's, it smells. Holy crap. Like something. <laughs> what? I wanted to say apple juice because you've now inceptioned me, but... Mm -hmm. Tangerine. That is orange, man. That is orange. Hmm. It's not bad. The holy yeah. crap was not like in disgust. It was just like it hit it hit me in the face. Orange. That's yeah. that's orange. It's almost like a someone tried to take like orange seltzer water and make it into beer. Is that all you're tasting is the tangerine? Are we just smacking? I don't think that helps. I mean, I want to say yes, I taste something else, but I can't by any means mm -hmm. tell you what. So, sure, that's all I taste. Okay. The description on mm -hmm. their website is a kick flip of an IPA. Kick flip. Kick. Which is Blah. skateboarding, not surfing. Mm -hmm. I guess you could do it surfing. People do it when they wake surf. Mm -hmm. They kick flip. Uh, swell rider is made to be enjoyed relentlessly Ooh. throughout the day. Throughout the day. Yep. I mean, you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning. Splashed with tangerines and waves of pineapple, mango, and stone fruit hops. Mm -hmm. Stone fruit. Yeah, I don't know. What is stone fruit? I don't know. I guess I could see that. It's very, yeah. Uh, that tangerine is the definitely the... Main so element. It's more of a splash. <laughs> splash of the others. It'll drink. Yeah. But it, yeah, it is very. Very orangey. Well, tangerine. -y. Tomato, tomato. Mm. I realize they are, in fact, different Days, things. They different fruits. But they're very similar. So, D9 Brewing was started in 2014. And it was started by two engineers and a doctor. Okay. I guess it's a common practice in more like high stress, high like intensity mm -hmm. positions to be a home brewer because I feel like that's been behind the scenes of a lot of things have been like doctors, engineers. Yeah. Um, well, it's something to do at home too. Right. But it's like that activity to like yeah. release you from... All the mm -hmm. load of what your day is, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, um, their current location is up in Lake Norman, 
We call it the foundry. Mm-hmm. And produces a crap ton of beer and ships it all over the place. Um, kind of standard uh, Charlotte brewery vibes there. You got the foods and the friends and the all the good stuff coming around there. Um, they're most known for their sours. That's what I was going to say. And are uh, recognized by the other breweries around town for that as well. Um, when yeah. we had gone to Eleven Lakes last season, I almost said last year, but last season, uh, they had mentioned that just the really cool community that had developed in those more northern breweries and how mm-hmm. um, D9 has uh, been really cool with helping them develop and uh, i believe it was them who gave like they re they got a new bar top in d9's brewery and so they kind of gifted their old one to 11 lakes when they were starting up so they had a good one to work with and Mm -hmm. um they had you know talked about how cool of an impact they had on them as well um and they are opening up a second location called the pavilion which will be opening in uptown in early 2020 so Mm -hmm. Give it a few months. I believe it see. was supposed to open up in 2019. Sure. And got pushed I mean, back. So maybe 2020. Sure. Maybe 2021. <laughs> well, it's something. I mean, we followed a lot of brewery openings and almost all of them have been. Even yeah, we yeah. did Middle James last week and it had only opened a month prior when it was originally supposed to open, I think, start of this year. Yeah. So they all get pushed back. Yeah. I mean, red tapes everywhere. So. But yeah, they have like off the wall type beers, mm-hmm. um, cotton candy, saltwater taffy. <laughs> That's something. Kung Fu rabbits. It's a sour ale. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, sours. Yep. What are they known for? For sure. We did not get one. No. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. Mm hmm. All right, so we're back up in the Cornelius era, area. Wow, words are not easy, guys. Sheesh. Uh, so we're back up there. We, I believe, only have been up there once with Eleven Lakes, and then we talked about that whole Cornelius Davidson Lake Norman debacle of how it's all like sort of one in the same, but not really one in the same, yeah. and it's up there. It just all gets kind of mushed. So I know. Uh, we followed the same tactic when it came to stories this week, but mm. uh, so we both have some some gentlemen we were going to talk about. But I'm gonna let you take her away unless you've got anything else to throw in. No. So the guy I'm doing today, mm-hmm. his name is Brian Boss. Ooh, like um, the water. Yes. Is it V O S S? Yes. Like okay. the water. I don't believe he started that water oh. company. Okay. Uh, but, you know, recently we've been doing... God, this beer is so orange. It's so orange. Recently we've been doing people who were born here but then moved away. Mm-hmm. So the guy, Brian, was not born here. Bevos. And moved here. Okay. And Bevos. is still here. Nuh-uh. Yep. He's here now. Well, all right. And just recently. So, I don't know. Hmm. But okay. Okay. Um, He was born... Well, I'm going to start off with... We will probably never get to talk about another person of this profession on this podcast. Okay. So, you better listen. Because this is all you're getting. <laughs> Uh, Brian Voss was born August 4th, 1958. Oh, okay. Um, doesn't say that he was born in Alaska, but it does say he grew up in Anchorage. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume he was also born in Anchorage. Uh, when he was six years old, his father took ownership of a bowling center. Oh. So he went there and bowled quite a bit. I like it. Is my understanding. I like it. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, His family later moved to Colorado. Uh, He started working at another bowling center, uh, but was struggling to pay for college at the time. And what does any young male do when he has no idea what he wants to do with his life? Stripper. 
and doesn't have any money. <laughs> no, he doesn't strip. He no, enlists. That's only girls. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He enlists in the army. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he spent two years as an army electronics technician. Oh. Working on radars and such. Okay. Uh, kind of far from bowling centers. A little bit. But I'm sure he had to work on the Machinery, pin setter. Yeah. Um, during this time, he participated in intramural bowling. Mm-hmm. And notice I said he was only in the Army for two years. Mm-hmm. Well, he won two All-Army Championships. For bowling? Yes. I'm just, all I'm thinking is Forrest Gump with ping pong right now. Yeah. So, yeah. He, uh, I guess he competed in two and won two. Hmm. So he's decent, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, all right. Uh, after getting out of the army in 1982, he tried his hand at the PBA Tour, hmm. which stands for the Professional Bowling Association. Um, I thought it was the peanut butter, and and they were just waiting for the jelly. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> I'm like edit that out. <laughs> yeah, it won't be unfortunate. So I'm um, sad day. Yeah, because you got to do it. I know. Are you gonna do that? I'll think about it. Um, he won his first PBA Tour title in 1983, hmm. so a year later. Um, I'm assuming that it is like golf, because mm-hmm. I know golf a lot better than I do sure. bowling. And so every competition tournament that they play in is called a title. Okay. Um, and then... Well, when you win, it's a title. Mm -hmm. He won one major title, the 1988 PBA National Championship, which in golfing is like Masters, U.S. Open, the Open, Mm -hmm. and PGA Championship. Okay. So, big title. Won it five years after his first tour title. Okay. Um, also, in 1988, he earned a then record $225,000. Nice. Well, $225,485. Oh. To be exact. Yeah, don't cut that out. I need to get the change. For real. Um, I didn't get how much that would be worth today. Well, 88. 88. Yeah. I mean, that's a solid 31 years. I mean, that's my it year. could be a lot because gas has changed a lot since Yeah, it so. has changed a lot. So it may be, may be worth more. And I'm sure they probably get paid more I mean, I'm sure it is. It's now. just a matter yeah. of um, significance. Yeah. He was named PBA Player of the Year. Nice. That year, 1988. It's a good um, year. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. It says from 1987 to 1998. Uh, those were his, his prime. Mm-hmm. Uh, he won at least one title in all those seasons. Which the record was 17 and that was 12. So fell a little short. But he could have gone longer possibly. But he broke his wrist. Oh. Which I feel like is very important. A little bit. In bowling. A little bit. Especially the way they spin that thing. Yeah. (laughs) How? Yeah. That hurts. Um, During those years, 1987, 1998... Big success, obviously, mm-hmm. and when you are successful, people have catchphrases. Oh goodness! So Tell you know, me more. Tim Tebow, Tebow time. Mm-hmm. That's the only one I can think of. <laughs> uh, his catchphrases were, "Don't cross the Voss, cross the Voss." Maybe it's pronounced fa- Voss, Voss, Voss. Don't cross the Voss. Don't cross the boss. Okay. And Voss is boss. <laughs> See, that don't work. Voss is boss. Well, you're saying, oh, a lot more in there. Boss. Yeah, so you got to... Voss is boss. But that's two different... That's saying it to cross and boss. I guess that does make sense. <laughs> <laughs> so don't cross the boss. don't know words. Voss. Listen, Southern boy. <laughs> and Voss is boss. Yes. Okay. It's great. They work. <laughs> Who knew? There's two catchphrases. <laughs> Um. So those are cool. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, that's something. I'm trying not to pick on it that much because he could be a listener. 
That's true. Somebody get him on here. <laughs> uh, are you one of our three listeners, Mr. Voss? Maybe. Be Voss. Where are you at? Um, so he was known for exceptional versatility. Ooh. I really being able to bowl well on multiple oil patterns. Apparently, I was like, "What does they that even have mean?" Different oil Ooh, patterns, like how they oil the floor that I the guess. ball. Goes. That's so, so maybe they like go straight down. One turn, some they go across. Maybe some they go slanted, skewed. I never in a million and years would have thought of that being a thing. Yeah, I didn't know either. I thought that shit just like right dried evenly and flat. That's so interesting. Yeah, because I mean, especially in that kind of a thing, like that can really. Yeah. Like you would feel like it wouldn't affect it, but that could affect it a lot. Interesting. I had no clue. Never in a million years would I have yeah. thought about that. I don't know. I just go and roll the ball. I mean, yeah. Right through that gutter. That's Next what time I I'm going to ask, how do y'all, what's your oil pattern? Oh my God, do it. Here. I just want to see if they know. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, we just brush it. Yeah. It goes down. <laughs> <laughs> cool. At a, what's the place called in Monroe? Fox. Fox's Alley or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah, don't I don't worry. know. If they, they, they might know. Who knows? Um, according to PBA.com, Voss was a threat to win any event in which he entered. Noise. That's a good threat to be. Uh, yep. His versatility helped him collect over $2.4 million hmm. in career PBA earnings. All right. And currently stands fifth all time in that category. Nice. Hey, Bevos, you want to be a sponsor? <laughs> Bevos. Um, yeah, we homes now. Yeah. More homies. Because he's a listener. Yeah. Because he's in Cornelius. Yeah. As we speak. Mm-hmm. Um, he's my daddy's age. 58. My, dad, my daddy was 57, but I mean, close, close enough. enough. Jinx. Uh, Voss lost. lost. <laughs> <laughs> Drew ain't got no words, and now he's screwed. Voss lost his... Those ones do not match. You yes. are correct. <laughs> Voss Brian, lost... <laughs> Be Voss. Brian uh -huh. lost his PBA Tour <laughs> exemption following the 2006-2007 season. Guess he was slacking a little bit. Sheesh. Um, but was reinstated as an exempt player for 2009-2010 under the PBA's new Golden Parachute Rule. Ooh. And that had such a cool name that I looked it up. Nice. And I am going to read verbatim <laughs> what was on the PBA website Tell back me. in 2009. Tell me. The PBA will award one golden parachute mm -hmm. exemption, not only for the World Series of Bowling, which is a thing. Mm -hmm. That wasn't verbatim. I added that. <laughs> But for the balance of the 2009-2010 PBA Tour season. Mm. To a player who held a PBA Tour exemption in any of the past four seasons. He just barely made that cut because he was three seasons ago. Mm -hmm. But is no longer exempt. The PBA leadership will screen applications and announce the player selected. Here comes the good part. To apply for the... Golden parachute exemption. <laughs> he keeps air quoting. It was funny. <laughs> Players are required to send an email to Barb Wilt. I feel like Good old those Barb are Wilt. two shortened names. Mm -hmm. Like Barbara is probably her full first name. And Wilted is her. <laughs> Wilton? Yeah. I feel like Wilt is a fine last name. Yeah, I guess. But Barb Wilt. At the PBA National Office in Seattle with a response to this statement. More air quotes. Mm -hmm. Please give a brief overview of why you should be given the golden parachute exemption. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was an essay. <laughs> essay contest. Yeah. Come bowl with us. Um, apparently he's a good writer and they gave him the one exemption. I mean, I also want to know how many people fit those stipulations <laughs> of in the last four years, they did hold an exemption, but no longer do. And still want to. And still, yeah. I mean, I don't knock his 
uh, determination to go and do it. But I mean, how many people actually yeah. fall into that category? I don't, probably not many if you're just sending an email to Barb Wilt that's like, yo, I want to be the golden parachute. Mm-hmm. And here's why I should. I mean, it seems like a legit evaluation that was going on of like who deserved it. Mm-hmm. But anyhow, our boy Brian mm-hmm. got it. Nice. In that season, at age 51, mm-hmm. Voss won his 25th PBA Tour title. Nice. A mixed doubles championship with Deandra S. Body. <laughs> Sorry, what? A S B A T Y. That's not how I anticipated that being spelled. Yeah. Or as Beatty. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know bowlers. <laughs> that is the best last name ever. Carry on. Um, With the win, Voss bowled as an exempt player for the 2010-2011 PBA Tour season. This made him the oldest exempt player on tour at that time. Mm-hmm. So what it is, is I'm assuming the way you lose your exempt status is just not play well. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming that's what it is. Sure. On August 3rd, 2016, a day shy of his 58th birthday, mm-hmm. Voss won his first PBA 50 tour hey. title at the Dave Smalls Championship. Oh, Dave Smalls. Lane's Classic. Hey. <laughs> That's something else. Um, in Anderson, Indiana. He won his second PBA 50 tour title on May 2nd, 2018 at the Mooresville Open Ooh. in Mooresville, North Carolina. Get it. So, awards and recognition mm-hmm. here from, I believe, straight from Wikipedia. I did add the top one because they didn't have it in there. Wikipedia needs to get on it. Yep. But... He had 25 PBA Tour titles. That's 10th all time. Hey. Plus two titles on the PBA 50 Tour and one PBA 60 event title. Oh. Um, I'm assuming that just means 50 and over and mm-hmm. 60 and over. He mm-hmm. was the PBA Player of the Year, as I previously stated, in 1988. The Harry Smith PBA Points Leader Award in 87 and 88. Mm-hmm. Inducted into the PBA Hall of Fame, 1994. Inducted into the USBC Hall of Fame, 2007. Um, I have two more things, but I need to tell you what USBC stands for, because I, of course, didn't know. Do you have a guess? United States Bowling Champions. United States Bowling Congress. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I don't either, but it sounds fancy. <laughs> yeah, it's official. I think you get Esquire put on the end of Ooh, your name. I think you do. After you mm-hmm. get inducted to that Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Through the end of the 2008-2009 season, he had rolled 52 perfect games. Dang. In PBA events. That's not Lifetime. Who knows how many? Dang. Uh, he was ranked number 13 on the PBA's list of 50 greatest players of the last 50 years. Wow. That was done in 2008. But yeah, that's cool. Uh, he moved to the Charlotte area in 2008. Um, apparently, he moved because he had an opportunity to teach. Ooh. Um, so I was like, where are you teaching at? Yeah. I'll list that. People can go learn. But uh, couldn't find him anywhere. <laughs> so in pure sleuth fashion, mm-hmm. I found his Facebook. Nice. And he had this post in 2008. Remember, this man's a private eye, y'all. If yeah. you need something on the DL. He says, to all my friends and fans, I've recently made a move to the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Have a nice opportunity here, focus on, focusing on teaching high-level bowling, as well as intermediate and beginners. Hmm. So he's just teaching yep. bowling. Yep. <laughs> I'll also be involved in programs designed to elevate the competitive bowling environment. Ooh. He may be responsible for that midnight glow bowling. Ooh. That's all I'm saying. 
Probably not. Yeah. But seems competitive enough. Sure. Um, anyone interested in some high level coaching, you can PM me. Most of my teaching will be focused at a few bowling centers. George Papa's Victory Lanes in Mooresville. Hey. And Ten Park Lanes in Charlotte. Hey. But certainly not limited to those. And as said by my good friend Mike Machuga, mm. for the love of the game. Yes. Happy bowling, everyone. <laughs> exclamation, exclamation. Well, all right. So I guess just hit them up. Slide into those DMs. Mm-hmm. If you want to learn some bowling? I mean, it's been 11 years, so who knows? But yeah. Give them a shot. Maybe that was, two, that was 2018. Did I say 2008? Yeah. I did. 2018. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. get in those yeah. DMs, guys. I did say 2008 multiple mm-hmm. times about when he moved here. He moved 2018. So hey. he's just recently okay. Cornelius. Oh. Uh, but well, he dang. lives there now and he teaches <laughs> bowling. Well, shoot. Rock on, man. Maybe next year instead of fantasy football, we'll have a bowling league. Oh, God. <laughs> I will lose yeah, my before shoulder, it even starts. My shoulder can't handle that. I will lose before it starts. But that's my story. I like it. Brian Voss. 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 Be Voss. Voss. Be Voss. Hit us up. We'll be friends. Cool. But I'm going to actually do the opposite. And uh, tell you a story about a gentleman who was born and raised in this fair part of town. Okay. And his name is Mr. James Hoyt Wilhelm. Okay. Yes. I didn't know it. James. Yes. Hmm. Hoyt is his middle name. One of those southern folks that, you know, they got a first name, but they ignore it and yeah, they go they by their middle use, one. They don't use it. And nobody realizes. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. But yeah. So, let's dive in. Mr. James Hoyt Wilhelm, a.k.a. Hoyt, born July 26, 1922. Roaring twenties. Mm-hmm. In our Grand Cornelius area. Word. One of eleven children. Okay. Went to high school at Cornelius High. Uh, I didn't even know there was a Cornelius Cornelius High. But there you go. He was a pitcher on his high school baseball team. Okay. Where he attended. At Cornelius High. <laughs> yeah. Who knew? Strange. Yeah. Oranges, guys. Oranges. So, he was a pitcher, but he couldn't throw fast. Okay. (laughs) So, he had major league aspirations. Mm -hmm. And from that, he uh, decided he was going to start practicing the knuckleball. Okay. He read a book about Dutch Leonard. Read a book? Yeah. Okay. About Dutch Leonard, who was another pitcher who, uh, I guess, was well known for the knuckleball. I don't follow baseball, so I don't don't, certainly don't know know, like historic baseball. All I know is Jackie Robinson. (laughs) I mean, I know he's not a pitcher, but like that's my like Jackie Robinson and Babe Ruth. They're like my baseball history. And then you got you know A Rod and whatnots, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa shenanigans, but. That's about all I know. I believe Tim Wakefield threw the knuckleball for the Red Sox Hmm. uh, not too long ago. Fair enough. Late 90s. Um, But he read a book about uh, Dutch Leonard. And so he started focusing on the knuckleball, started working with a tennis ball to like really Mm -hmm. try to perfect it. um, And ultimately knew that was would be his best shot at actually playing in the major leagues. So he ended up actually playing several years in the minors. Kind of hopped around to uh, several different teams and did make it to the major leagues where he started when he was 29 years old. Okay. So, in 1942 is where he started his minor league years with the Mooresville Moors. <laughs> that, was a, that was a team. Okay. They were a Class D North Carolina State League. So old school baseball. I don't know what that means. Yep. So that's where he started. Um, 
he was with them for a few years and then I'm not, it doesn't say that he enlisted. So I don't know if he was just called up or what, but he served in the military when soon was that? thereafter. Um, you said 42 was when he started. When he started baseball, so when he started World minor II. leagues. Yes. So that was going to be the next thing is he served oh. in World War II. Uh, he played a part in the Battle of the Bulge. And he ended up getting hurt and earned a Purple Heart from that battle. Hmm. So he played his entire major league career with a piece of shrapnel embedded in his back as a pitcher. Yeah. I wonder how many can say that. Yeah. Uh, he ended his military career as a staff sergeant. Um, I used to know what all the rankings were. I don't know what that is anymore. E six. Okay. I was like, I know up to E4. So, so fair enough. Um, so he came back to baseball into the Mooresville Moors in 1946. So it seems like he had just a very short, maybe a two year career mm-hmm. there as well. Not positive. Um, they kind of glossed over the whole military time, except the shrapnel embedded yeah. in his back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he came back to the Moors in 46. He, from there on out, was nicknamed Old Sarge. From his military time, he spent a few years hopping between several different minor league teams uh, before they brought him up to the majors. And he was actually, by one of his uh, coaches and like team of coaches, whatever you would call it, uh, was told to forget the knuckleball and to just be done with it and move on and fix your life, <laughs> basically. And, you no good. Yeah. And he's like, nope, I'm going to do this. This this is all I've got. I'm going for it, you know. Uh, and during his time in the minors, he was primarily a starting pitcher. Um, there you go. So then he made his major league debut with the New York Giants. Not the football team. Correct. That's probably why they say New York Giants football. Hmm. Because they had a New York Giants baseball. Yeah. And I don't know what years the Giants were a thing yeah. for baseball and all of that. And if it was... I mean, would that be like in place of the Yankees or the Mets? Or is that like an entirely different team where they're three? It's probably a different league. Mm. Who knows? Back well, then, I mean, back then baseball was huge. So there was probably multiple leagues, multiple. Well, they yeah. said his MLB debut mm-hmm. was with the New York Giants on April 18th, 1952. He batted for his first time. During his third game on April 23rd, 58, on that first bat, he hit a home run over the right field fence, and he went on in his career to bat a total of 432 more times and never once hit a home run otherwise. (laughs) Nice. Uh, For his rookie season, he was solely a relief pitcher. Mm -hmm. Uh, However, he was... In the top 10 uh, voting for MVP contention for Rookie of the Year. Um, or no, not for Rookie of the Year. He was top 10 in voting f- for MVP. Okay. Uh, he was the first relief pitcher to finish that high in voting. And he was second in voting for Rookie of the Year. Okay. Good movie. Yes. <laughs> He, throughout his career, he played for 20 years in the majors. Okay. So 1952 to 1972. He, you know, jumped around a little bit. So he played for the New York Giants, the St. Louis Cardinals, the Cleveland Indians, the Baltimore Orioles, the Chicago White Sox, the California Angels, the Atlanta Braves, the Chicago Cubs, and the LA Dodgers. Okay. Which... A journeyman. Yes. The... uh, Angels brought me to Angels in the Outfield. So, you know, some more throwback movies from our time. Um, I believe he spent the majority of his time with the Giants. Uh, maybe like half a third mm-hmm. to half of his career, and then it was more bouncing around. It did give all of the years of it, but it just got to be more convoluted yeah, than necessary. Yeah. So, um, Thinking about it, though, the Yankees definitely existed. Then. Yes, they did. I have things to say so. about them. And that's why I was like, I don't know. I don't know. But. It could have been in place. I don't know about the Mets. Yeah, I'm not sure when they popped up, but. I don't know. Or they the could have just had just, three or four. 
yeah. it seems. So. Hard to say. Um, in his major league times, he was almost always a relief pitcher. However, he did start a couple of times. In 1954, over two games, he pitched two and a third innings uh, to help win a World Series where they had a four-game sweep over the Indians. Cool. In 1958, he was uh, playing for the Baltimore Orioles and pitched the first no-hitter in Baltimore's history. Okay. Okay. Um, over the course of his career, he won 124 games as a relief pitcher, which was a major league record. Okay, yeah. He was the first to appear in 1,000 games, and I believe they said he uh, finished his career at 1,070 games, um, and the first to reach 2,000 saves. Um, I think both of those stats are as a pitcher. I know saves is as a pitcher, but... Um, I believe both of those were yeah. relating to him as a pitcher. Uh, he was one of the oldest players to pitch. His last game that he played in was 16 days shy of his 50th birthday. So hold on. Yes. He played in 1,070 games, mm -hmm. but had 2,000 saves? 200. 200. Okay. Yes. Did I, I don't know if I said 1,000. I don't remember. I heard 2,000 <laughs> in my head. So. <laughs> 200 saves, okay. 1,070 games. Okay. Just wanted to clarify, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that seemed impossible. I mean, <laughs> magic. Um, and those are major league stats. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, his last game was just two weeks shy of his 50th birthday. He was the oldest player in the major, le major leagues for each of his last seven years. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. I mean, yes, but I mean. But, yeah, that he lasted that long. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Because uh, if you was the oldest pitcher <laughs> one year and you played the next, you'd probably still be the oldest. Right. Pitcher. But but yeah. Nonetheless, the last seven seasons, he, he held that title. Impressive. Uh, he was part of the trend, which is cool to see. Um, like he wasn't just like a relief pitcher that was like, okay, we just need you to help us survive the game. Um, he was good enough that he became part of the changing trend where relief pitchers um, historically at that point were just brought into like, okay, like we're here, we've survived, our starting pitcher is exhausted and dead. Yeah. Now we're just going to bring you in to finish us out. But during his time is when they started shifting partially because of his talent to um, relief pitchers would come in before the starting pitcher was even ready to be left mm -hmm. but it was right when the game would get really close and in tight contention then they're like all right you're up like, yeah where it wasn't so much due to exertion but effectiveness yeah and so he kind of yeah. helped direct that change mm -hmm. so that was cool um, he was inducted into the baseball hall of fame in 1985 and is one of 83 pitchers in there. He was the first relief pitcher ever inducted. Hmm. Um, he was actually on the voting for that for yeah, probably several years prior to him actually getting in. And he like made it so close several times, but yeah. But yeah so he ended up being the first relief pitcher inducted in uh, 1985. Um, at his induction ceremony, he said that he had accomplished all three of his goals for the major leagues, which were to uh, appear in a world series to be named to an all-star team, which I didn't mention, but he had been named to several, um, and to pitch a no-hitter. Hmm. So, rock on him. Nice. He had one of the lowest career uh, earned run averages. At ERA, yep. <laughs> Clearly, I follow baseball. I know RBIs. I know that. That's about it. <laughs> um, at 2.52. Mm, yeah. He retired um, as a player in 1972. And after that, he did some coaching. He did two one-season stints with minor league teams uh, with the Braves. So two seasons, one apiece with two different minor league Richmond. teams with Braves. Braves what? Richmond Braves? I don't know. What? I'm so That's confused. That's one of their minor league okay. teams. I don't know. I'm I don't know. and stuff. Um, and then he spent 22 years as a minor league pitching coach with the Yankees. Hmm. Uh, and he would not... 
he specifically said he would not teach people how to throw a knuckleball because he believed they needed to have um, kind of like a born knack for it. And so only then would he work with somebody on the knuckleball. Like he would help them be a pitching coach, but he wouldn't specifically go out of the way and be like, all right, here, let me show you how to throw a knuckleball. Like they needed to prove they were already inclined to it okay. before he would work with them. And there was actually, I didn't write this down, but they l- let him specifically like mentor and coach a few pitchers on the knuckleball who were on other teams even though he was a coach for the Yankees, but they like agreed because he was so adamant about that. Yeah, yeah. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, didn't find any dates on this because nobody cared apparently, but he was married to a woman named Peggy. Don't know when, but that happened. Hmm. They have three kids, Patty, Pam, and Jim. I don't, I don't know. It was all the peas and then Jim. So I, I don't know if he was like the redheaded stepchild or something, but Patty, Pam, and Jim from Peggy. And they lived out the remainder of their lives in Sarasota, Florida. Um, at least he did. Mm-hmm. Can't say about anybody else because we they were just a passing mention of existence. Um, but he passed away on August 23rd in 2002 of heart failure. 80. Nice. So he, he did some stuff. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, yeah, like he was... Born and raised in the Cornelius area, went to high school here, played in the minor leagues here for several years, and war hero, pitched his entire major league, and I mean, the majority of his minor league career, with shrapnel in his back, and he like earned a purple heart for it, and came back and played in the major leagues for 20 years, set all kinds of records, and yeah. A trooper. Yeah. Rock on, old Sarge. It's crazy the things you find out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's like some people right in your backyard that yeah you've never heard of. Yeah, this is the running theme of this season. We should just start picking like person, place, or thing per season. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like this season, we're gonna highlight all the cool peeps. <laughs> but so that's what I've got, Mister James Hoyt, aka Hoyt, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's chill. I'm just really impressed he's about chill. the. I'm just super impressed that yeah he. Got a freaking purple heart. Shrapnel in his back. And I know people like suffer with things every day and do their stuff every day, but he basically had just started his career. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, no, I'm going to do this and did freaking well and kind of like overcame all the things going against him. Like wasn't a fast pitcher. Yeah. Still made it into the freaking major leagues. Yeah, see, that's where it gets me is he said, you got to have a born knack for it. He mm-hmm. learned that. He read a dang book. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he thought his born knack for it was he knew he was a pitcher, but knew he couldn't throw fast, and so that meant he had a knack for the knuckle bomb. I don't know. I guess. I don't know. I guess it was probably something of, like, if he was working with a pitcher that clearly knew how to, like, traditionally pitch, there was no sense in trying to steer him away from it or add something different yeah. into that mix. I don't know. Yeah. But. Well, I mean... If you're in the major, if he's coaching them, they're already in the majors or the minors mm-hmm. or wherever. Minors. They already know how to pitch. Mm-hmm. You know, like, they're not going to be learning that many new pitches. Like, sometimes that happens. Mm-hmm. Like, when they get older, they'll change up their change up. <laughs> the puns but, this guy has, guys. But, yeah, just a regular pitcher going to a yeah. knuckleball is not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, there's and probably, I don't even know if there's a single pitcher right now that does a knuckleball. ball. Mm-hmm. It's very rare. Yeah. And it was funny too, because I read some commentary that I like just sort of skimmed over where they were interviewing, I don't know if it was a coach or a teammate or who, but basically said that there's just so much movement and action in his pitches that they're pretty sure he doesn't even know what's going to happen well, every yeah, time he pitches don't. it. Yeah. And so it's like, it also just adds to the interestingness mm-hmm. <laughs> of him saying like well no like you need to have a knack for it like basically yeah. saying you need to be in control of this you, this needs to be part of who you are but like you don't even know what's going on you're just <laughs> lobbing it <laughs> yeah maybe he's just like a grumpy old dude that don't feel like teaching nobody like, maybe he's like this is my shtick and i yeah. ain't letting nobody else I'm take the knuckleball it thrower, mm-hmm. not you 
He's like, look, I read this book on this dude, and nobody knows who that dude is anymore. So yeah. if I make sure nobody else can do it, I'll be that guy forever. What if, like, the people he taught, he just, like, sent him the book? <laughs> Maybe. And I don't even know if the book was, like, how to throw a knuckleball. Mm-hmm. Like, it, I think it was more like a biography on this guy and them just talking about how he threw knuckleballs. Yeah. Like, I have no idea. But he seems like an well, interesting cool. dude. And, yeah, rock on. I also find it interesting that they called him Old Sarge mm-hmm. because I feel like most people there would have served. Maybe. I mean, it's World War II. Mm-hmm. A lot of people went. Yeah. And they're probably that age. Yeah. Minor league baseball. I think a lot of it was, um, like, at least in the majors, he didn't even start there until he was 29. So he's, like, kind of got a late start. And then... Or at least, I mean, again, I don't follow ball, so I don't know what it looks like. But they alluded to, if nothing else, at that time, it seemed like it was a late start to be yeah. getting into the majors. And then, yeah, was there for 20 years. And so he was like, they had a few other nicknames, but they were all like old something. Yeah, yeah. And so that was just kind of like his legacy was being this old dude. I mean, yeah. considering how long how long he lasted. And um, there were a few more like sort of records of just like that had to deal with his age and how many seasons he played at that age and that kind of stuff but interesting yeah also i don't know if you notice but the sun is a tangerine oh looky there i didn't see that we're looking at the can of the swell rider i did not i didn't actually look at this can well i just kind of popped it open and started chugging but there you go, people. There's a nice tangerine sun. Because the can has like surfer chick or whatever just sitting on a board on the water. And, uh, you know, sun setting in the background. And the sun is, in fact, a tangerine. Well, cool. So, really fast non-segue into fantasy. I got my ass kicked and I'm not happy about yeah. it. The stupid Patriots dude. Patriots dude. <laughs> Not happy with you. Uh, he came out with 175 points. Yeah. What in the world? Oh, that's this week. Week yeah, four. We ain't there yet. That's what we want to see. Yeah. Patriots Dynasty 6 6 came out with 175.98 points. <laughs> what in the world? And like I came out with one fifteen eighty. I mean, yeah. So which I mean, is like not a bad that's game. not a bad week. It's not a good week either per se, but it's not a bad week. And homie just kicked my butt. What killed me though is like Panthers defense came out like rocking it for me. They gave me fourteen points. So Panthers respect. <laughs> but I had like Wat uh, Watkins and. Camara usually kill it for me and jointly they got me less than 20 points so that sucked and then I will say is I had like a last minute panic over picking up a quarterback because Garoppolo is on by and Breeze mm-hmm. he gone and so I picked up last minute quarterback which got me 22 and a half points so that was a really good saving grace but yeah, I mean, it was a mediocre week for me. It just sucked that I lost so bad to yeah. 175 points, man. What in the world? Well, I hate to rain on your parade. Yeah, but shut it. I'm 4 0. Douche. Still got the two by my name, though. Not a big fan of that. Sucks to suck. But, yeah, so I beat Fumble Abiyuski. 130 uh, to 113. Yep. She goes down to 1 and 3. Mm hmm. Uh, hindsight is twenty twenty against two pint conversation. Yep, the number one. Also four and zero oh. stays number yep. one. Not and that sucks too because that was a ninety seven point four points to seventy nine point mm-hmm. ten. So like, had that matchup just been shifted a little bit and pfft. yeah, Chris with hindsight had Tom Brady get him three point seven points. <laughs> I mean, I feel bad for Chris, but God, Brady, I hate Brady, so rock on. What happened there? Just that you were awful. Yeah, I missed that game, so. Nothing but field goals. One touchdown. 
And I think it was a defensive touchdown or like a punt block or something. Mm. Yeah, I think That's it was a awesome. punt block for a touchdown. <laughs> Who did they play? I'm not real sure. Uh, Buffalo. That is awesome. But yeah, I think their one touchdown was a punt block. So no offensive touchdowns. That's excellent. But it might be better than like me losing to this Patriots dynasty mm-hmm. sucks, but with Brady going down hard, I'm right with it. Uh, so we had Pain Train against Paps Interference. Thought Pain Train was going to pull out his first win. I was really hoping for you, dude. But we had one player left. Who was that? It was a Monday night game. Connor. Yep. It was Pittsburgh Connor. running back. And uh we caught it mid second quarter when we started looking at your points and we you were de- you were up by like twelve. Uh twelve, yeah. And we were like, Okay, he might get this. Touchdown. We we're like, Shit. <laughs> well, he gone. <laughs> and just yeah, instantly. Yeah, and it was like a twenty five yard touchdown. Yeah. So it was like one point for the catch, two and a half for the yards, six for the touchdown. Yeah. Pretty much ate it up. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, Paps interference two and two. Uh, hangover on downs, a solid three and one in third nice. place. Mm-hmm. Uh, beat Beer with Me CLT, who drops to one and three. Yeah, so one thirty six ninety seven there. Grieving helmets, one eleven, and Krabby Patties ninety. So we got two and two and one and three there. Yeah, so the standings. Two point two. conversation is still taking the lead by far. I say by far. Matched in uh games with Drew over here. And only nine points. Oh, only separating. nine now. Yeah. Ooh. Jeez. All did right. you read? Not upset. Also, now. people have scored eighty more points against me. <laughs> so I've had a fight for mine. Hangover on downs third. Patriots Dynasty moving up six places this week. Rude for fourth after that Listen, W. Rude. But we that's because we have one, two, three, four, five people at two and two. Mm-hmm. So that's all points. I'm at for. the bottom of that two and two, guys. Don't yeah, you? Yeah, that worry. points for not so great. I mean, you're only fifty behind. Mm-hmm. But yeah, which was like this week. That 50 behind I am came from mm-hmm. this week's game. <laughs> That's nuts. That sucks. Yep. Anyway, I got some work to do. Pain Train, <laughs> we're hoping for you. I hope you get yourself one. Yeah. I mean, old Krabby Patties is sliding too. They got a three loss streak. So they won the first one. Ain't one since. Mm-hmm. But got to pull out of that slump. Yep. Pick you up some peeps. Yeah. If there's anybody left. Yeah, it's it's slam piggins out there. Yeah. So this week we have got what matchups. All right, we got It'll Drink, Mr. Drew Golden, against two pint conversation. This one two battle. That. Is going to be excellent. There will only be one undefeated <laughs> team after this week. Yeah. Who, buddy? I'm excited. Patriots of Dynasty versus Fumble Ibiuski. Perhaps the interference against Hindsight is 2020. You got Hangover on Downs. That's the number three seed. I got to take them out. Yeah. Let's see how that goes. I mean, you're projected right now, but he may not have fixed it. I mean, I haven't touched mine either, so. Yeah, I haven't either. Pain Train and Krabby Patties. Let's see who gets rid of that losing streak. Yeah. Good luck to both of you. Grieving Helmets and Beer With Me CLT. It's going to be interesting. We're going to lose an undefeated this week. Unless y'all manage a tie. Did you know ties are a thing in fantasy? Yeah. Last year. It's tough. It's tough. Last year in my league, managed to tie with somebody. And it was like, you know, once you log in after it's officially completed, it'll pop up with like, oh, yay, you won. Or, oh, sucks. Maybe next time. Or, you know, whatever. And it popped up and it was like, we're as confused as you are. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, 
I was like, what? Like I screenshotted all kinds of stuff because I was like, what? Does this even happen? Yeah. That was Strange. Special. Yeah. But I'm excited. Who's going to take it, guys? I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say me, but I mean, the uh, cockiness has worked for me so far. Uh, you're not wrong. So I'm going to keep it going. Okay. I don't know what's going on here. you touching too much stuff. Well, good luck to you, sir. We'll see how Thanks. that goes. <laughs> um, anything else you want to throw out there? No. Let us know what y'all are thinking about your teams. Bribe us. I mean, we'll do yeah. some trades. Trades are still good to go. Mm -hmm. You can still do that. Yeah. Um, if there's any kind of breweries or anything, any if you have any random stories about Charlotte history, shoot them our way. We'd love to inspect if there's a certain brewery you're hoping for us to hit that we haven't yet, let us know. We're getting close to having hit all the main ones, I think. Are we? I think so. I mean, I there's mean, still yeah, there's at, still plenty, but we're trying to kind of scatter it and... Over the two seasons, this is episode 28. No, so. we're past 28. Because we did 21 uh, episodes the first season. Uh, and this is, ep this is season uh, episode 9. Is it eight? I think it's this eight. might be. I don't know. Pretty sure it's eight. Stand by. I'll tell you in one second. Yes, this is eight. So yeah, so this is episode twenty nine. Okay. So yeah, We're way past twenty eight. Twenty nine. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> I know we've been in theory trying to hold off on some of the bigger ones because when we come around next season, we'll be at the buzz bracket and trying to hit some of them. Mm -hmm. But. We'll probably hit all of them before we get to it. So yeah. if there's anything uh, specifically you want to hear from us, let us know. We like to talk to y'all. It's a good time. Yeah. But go check out D9. Get you some nice orange tangerine beer, a.k.a. Swell Rider. Or Sours if you're into that. I mean, yeah, Sours for show. If that's your jam, get to D9. But until then, uh, we'll kick your butts in fantasy. And somebody take down Patriots Dynasty. <laughs> and we will see you all next week. Check you later. Bye. Bye.